Hello everybody. Today's conversation is going to be about salt affected soils. And uh, this picture right here, this is one of the most uh, salt affected soils in the U.S. This is the Bonneville Salt Flats in uh, western Utah. Uh, it's famous for uh, being the place where uh, people go to try and set the uh, land speed record because it's big and it's flat and it's straight. And the whole area is covered in salt with no vegetation. So some of the uh, topics for this lecture. Effect of salt concentrations. Um, what are saline soils? What are sodic soils? The salt balance. The idea of reclaiming salty soils. Um, using chemical amendments to leach sodium. And uh, managing your salty soils, and then how do we actually measure the salts. So those are the things we're going to try and knock out in the next few slides. So first of all, salt, just in case uh, we're not comfortable with the idea of what salt is. So it's a mineral compound, um, primarily sodium chloride. So going off of our uh, periodic table, that'd be NaCl. Salt is essential for life because, and it's um, one of, like, it's one of the basic human tastes in terms of saltiness, something that that everybody is kind of familiar with. Uh, it's one of the oldest and most used food seasonings. So, and in uh, a lot of countries, um, not not so much the U.S., but um, but in other countries, a lot. Uh, it's very important in terms of food preservation. So you'll hear things like um, salt cured pork. That's one that um, I've had in Spain before where um, it's used to to ha let it last where especially in places where you uh, lack refrigeration salting is a way to to be able to preserve food um, sodium is a um, which is one of the the basics of the the salt compound uh, is an essential nutrient for human health and that's due to its role as an electrolyte and in those osmotic solute and so when we think about our electrolytes the things that kind of keep us going the things that when we're really lacking them we kind of notice it um, what's interesting is and why we know salt is essential for life in general is when we don't have enough salt we need it like in the case of, of needing electrolytes like um, how the reason the whole reason Gatorade and the sports drink revolution all that exists is is to get a little bit of salt into the system, um, as well as too much salt can uh, lead to, to cardiovascular diseases and problems. And so it's interesting that salt is both necessary, but it's definitely one of those things where in moderation, otherwise it can be problematic. And that goes for us, and that goes for our soils as well. So, um, in looking at the basics of salt, so sodium is a soft silver white reactive metal of the alkali metal group. And in the upper right corner, you can see our little uh, periodic table uh, there with the sodium. And um, naturally occurring sodium is in foods like celery, beets, and milk. Um, by weight, table salt is 40% sodium and 60% chloride. So, it's actually the smaller part of salt, uh, but about 90% of the sodium we eat is in that table salt form, that NaCl sodium chloride. The rest comes from other forms of sodium. Uh, baking soda is kind of kind of the the other most common one besides table salt. So, how did salt come to be? Where did salt come from, and how did we? come to understand it to be a problem. So uh, salt buildup first started ruining soil or becoming problematic uh, in back in Mesopotamia, back when they were first trying to figure out agriculture about 6,000 years ago. Uh, they were already dealing with salt issues. Um, about 10% of the world's soils or the world's arable or uh, suitable for growing crops soil uh, soil land is salt affected. So this is a, a decent sized problem and one tenth of the soils has to deal with it. Uh, almost all irrigated lands are salt affected to some extent. Um, part of the idea of the irrigation is to keep the salt under control and there's definitely a lot of different possible salt combinations 
and a lot of different combinations of ways we will see salts and soils and there's um, just a few of them down there. So going back to the idea of Mesopotamia and the beginnings of agriculture, uh, the plains of Mesopotamia are very flat and poorly drained. So that region has always had persistent problems with poor soil, drought, catastrophic flooding, silting, and soil salinity. So basically, if you want to think about the, the Fertile Crescent and the Mesopotamia area, it's a flat area, so easily can be flooded, but it's also very hot in terms of its uh, climate. So it, it goes through drought, and then you, it ends up having, um, can end up having poor soil when the water isn't, isn't there. And then you also have these problems with silting and soil salinity because you've got the, it's in between two rivers, so you're getting a lot of uh, movement of material in terms of sedimentation through those rivers and into the valley. And then um, with the salinity issues, that um, comes about because of just this, the, the buildup of salt in this, in this area. And it's the, one of the big things um, that caused it is it's difficult uh, to drain the water off the field. So there's always a tendency for the salt to build up in the soil coming through um, the water. So salt affected soils. When we say salt affected soils, what do we mean when we say salt affected soils? So they are soils with substantial enough salt concentrations to affect plant health or soil properties or water quality or some other land and soil uh, resource uses. And so uh, there's a picture on the le uh, of the two pictures on the bottom left there. You can see that the white uh, stuff in the rows, that's, that's salt buildup. And just it just builds up and basically chokes out and dehydrates the plant. And so in terms of how does it work and why is it problematic, if you look at the picture on the right, you can see um, the top part there where you've got our non-saline solution. And so you can see that water can easily work its way into the cell. No big deal. Lots of water being able to get into the cell. But when you introduce a saline soil solution, so the, the, you put salt into the soil solution, now you can see how little water is getting through and how all the salts just kind of decide to hang out right there next to the cell wall. And so it just kind of, it, it chokes the plant out it, and it takes up, the nutrients that the that the plant would be looking to get on its own. In terms of soluble salts, so soluble salts are very mobile in soil water and those are the problem salts in agriculture. So these are the ones that are building up and not allowing the water um, to be mobile within the soil. Uh, this comes from the weathering of soil minerals uh, coupled with inadequate runoff or drainage. So if water can't move very well in the soil and then you add in that um, some of the minerals within the soil weather away um, usually like we talked about earlier with Mesopotamia the ideas of, uh, of drought or some other problems coming in like the siltation or these other things that can cause uh, your soils to to weather away that plus the drainage problems leads to this salting effect um, salty soils normally contain only 0.4% of um, salt and so it's uh, it's like um, one-tenth of ocean water so it doesn't take like a lot of salt at all to, to ruin your soil I mean we're talking about zero uh, we're talking about four one hundredths of a percent four one hundredths of one percent and that's what we're talking about for salty soils so I mean it's not anywhere close to ocean water so it's really not a very high salt concentration necessary that would, can still cause a really huge problem um, just another kind of um, diagram of how this whole thing works and so this is a saline seep formation and so what happens is you get excess water up above and that excess water um, drains and in this case it drains down to the water table um, where there's some salt built up already because of this excess water problem over and over again. And so what happens is that through this permeable layer, that salt buildup just keeps happening and then it 
through gravity and through the the water movement ends up settling into the field instead of off of the hill there and then all of a sudden you end up with this salt concentration this um and in this case a saline seepage area but we also see the same thing happening on a much smaller scale just with our row crops you'll see the salt built up happening right at the top of the of the row and not off to the sides because that's where the water or that's where the um, weathering of the minerals will happen and so you'll get that salt build up right there right on the top so what does the salt concentration do to plants and uh, we just got a uh, kind of a basic diagram right here where you see a plant cell placed in water looks pretty much just like the plant cell up above but then you see the plant cell placed in the concentrated salt solution and you see the nucleus and the vacuole and everybody's all pinched in and people don't look happy or normal and so that's that's the basics of it at the cellular level what do we what can we see at the um at the the plant level or within the leaves so we can see direct to toxicity uh, especially of chloride is part of that uh, sodium chloride so um, you'll hear the term chlorosis um, and uh, what that looks like is leaf margin necrosis or what people like to call leaf burn so if you look at the picture on the right you'll see um, that 14 day salt stress you'll see the idea that um, it looks like the leaf got burned or that the the green has just been kind of sucked out of it so that's this idea of um, leaf margin necrosis. You really see it uh, in terms of the margin, the outside part of the leaf in the seven day one, where you see the outside part of the leaf just doesn't look good. It looks like it's it, like it's bad and struggling. So that's specifically leaf margin necrosis. The leaf burn is what we see in the 14 day one. Um, in another thing is that uh, it, uh, the effect on plants is that it's competing for water molecules. Um, so that's decreasing the osmotic potential with the plant roots and basically you can get salt induced drought. So basically the salt, if, if you get salt in the soils and they're hanging around the roots, the roots have a hard time exchanging ions and getting minerals um, and water to exchange very easily and the salt starts taking that stuff up and then that just basically um, kind of suffocates the, the plant or kind of uh, just dehydrates it and doesn't give it the, the minerals that it needs to be successful. Another thing you'll see in terms of salt effect on soils is clay dispersion or deflocc deflocculation. And so um, that's where you got clay particles basically exploding and spreading clay crystals through the soil. It's the big idea is when we talk about clay dispersion or deflocculation is this idea that you're destroying the clay structure. So we've always said um, when we talked earlier about soils, how um, clay and the structure of clay is, is important in terms of really giving the soil structure and, and keeping it, everything bound together. And so salt can just destroy that structure. Um, specifically, if we go into the specifics of it, sodium causes clay micelles to shrink as spaces between the adjacent crystal, crystalline layers uh, shrink, and then the micelles pull apart and almost dissolve in water, forming impermeable layers upon drying. What the hell does that mean? It's this idea. So, what, like, one of the things that you can see is surface crusting. So um, you end up with just this, uh, the fine particles, instead of uh, down below where we see nice structure in that soil, you see the fine particles just kind of form this surface cap. This, when you see, when you look on the left and you can actually see it in the guy's hand, how our structure of our soil and where we're used to aggregates and, and peds and all of that, instead of having structure to it, it just forms this cap of just, um, like impermeable soil where nothing can get through the seedlings can't emerge out they can't get water nothing is passing through it just becomes this this layer of just um, a mess of soil uh, on the on the left here uh, you can see kind of uh, down at the at the um, uh, mineral and the uh, compound level where 
you got your uh, cat ions and so you can see that in a when we've got our normal structure and everybody's all together we've got our calcium there no big deal able to do some cation exchange works out great b when you see the soil separated and pushed apart you can see it's all those um the um the sodium particles are in there and not allowing anything else to come in and so therefore it those particles just want to push apart because the the soil is take or the sodium is taking up all the water and taking up the minerals and not allowing the clay to bind together there's no space for it to 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 be able to to come together uh, another example here uh, in all but the sandiest soils dispersed clay will plug soil pores and impede water filtration and soil drainage so all the stuff that we've talked about in this class that's important so far in terms of soils you know getting water to infiltrate and move into the soil pores and having the soil drain properly and having cation exchange and having good structure all these things that we have talked about throughout the throughout the uh, the uh, semester so far are just become problematic when you have salt in the soil so what do um, what are the different kind of um, salt salt affected soils uh, so we have saline soil uh, where you have a high enough salt content to impair productivity and that's where you have um, your uh, electrical uh, conductivity greater than four uh, so maybe this type of soil a saline soil maybe any combination of salts but not high sodium a sodic soil is a high enough sodium content to affect soil structure so you can measure that in two ways the sodium absorption ratio or the exchangeable sodium percentage so uh, you have a sodic soil if it's greater than 13 with your SAR and you have if it's greater than 15 then it's a sodic soil with your ESP. Um, one slang term that's used for a sodic soil is black alkali because alkali we know um, that's more towards the uh, the basic side of things, less less acidic. Or when we get these saline soils, we're going to be much more on that side of the pH scale, and um, you'll get black spots uh, in sodic soils. And then you can also have a saline sodic soil where you have high salt concentration and high sodium concentration. Um, these used to be called alkali soils, but not anymore because alkaline um, soil means only your high pH, whereas um, these soils have, it's more than just the high pH. And so then on the top right there, I've got the soils, the saline sodic and saline sodic, and just the different ways that you can measure that. And you can see that with... Uh, the sodic soils you have really high pH so um, you got soils that are greater than uh, eight and a half in pH so really towards that alkaline side so here's some examples on the top left we have a saline soil on the uh, bottom left you can see a sodic soil and that that black alkali that we talked about with the black spots in mixed in there with the salt and then we have these four soils uh, on the right. So you'll see uh, in the bottom right, that one that's labeled D, that is a regular, uncontaminated, got good structure to its soil with things growing in it. A, B, and C, these are problematic. So A is a saline sodic soil, so one that's high in salt and high in sodium. In B, we have a saline deposit on a stream bed. And then C, you've got a sodic soil. And so all of those problematic and you can see the stuff growing there or lack of things growing there because of these salt concentrations and just it's hard the whole thing with with soil or at least hopefully um with the way i've been teaching you the whole thing about soil is it's an ecosystem it everything works together it's got to in order for it to be fertile soil everything's got to work everybody's got to be a player everything's got to come together and if you get one thing that's throwing everything off everything kind of goes bad everything um, you know it doesn't become useful anymore and that's the problem that we see in a B and C 
So then we want a salt balance because we don't want too much salt, but we also don't, we, we know we need some salt. Um, so some salts will always be added to the soil and irrigation water because we know we have um, salt, some salt in water. We just, um, you know, we have a con, there's a certain content of water that we're comfortable with. Or, sorry, certain content of salt that we're comfortable with in terms of uh, our water. So salt content of soil which in, will reach an equilibrium when the content equals added salts minus leached salts. So when we're talking about a leaching requirement, we're talking about the amount of irrigation water needed to pass completely through the root zone to keep salt concentration be, below economic levels of yield reduction. So what does that mean? <laughs> well, the simple thing to think about is the idea that if we're going to irrigate, we want to have enough water that it's going to go all the way through the root zone and it's going to keep our salt where we want it to. We're not going to have um, that excess water to where salt can build up, but we're also not going to have too little water that um, that there's stress or and we get weathering of the, the minerals in our soil and we get salt buildup that way. So we don't want too much water that could lead to salt buildup. and We don't want too little water that could also lead to salt buildup. We want this salt balance. And so we have a formula there in terms of leaching requirement where it's our, our EC of applied water um, divided by our EC of our drainage water. And we'll, we'll talk about that, those measurements at the, uh, towards the back side of the lecture. But we have this example. So alfalfa needs about four feet per season of, um, EC of irrigated water. So, um, so that equals two. You got, uh, EC of drainage water being four. Two divided by four is 0. 0.5. 0. 0.5 times our four feet at the beginning is two feet. So we need two feet of extra water added per season to keep salts from building up in the soil. So a um, couple ways that we can get that done is by using drainage, either using a tile drainage or using a ditch drainage and trying to uh, get make sure we can get rid of that excess water and um, keep, keep, thing, keep it from building up on the soil. So in terms of our salt balance and salinity, um, we know that salts are a common necessary component of the soil and that many salts are essential plant nutrients and we know that soil salinity is a measure of the total amount of soluble salts in the soil. As our salinity levels increase plant extra plants extract water less easily or it becomes more difficult so you get aggravated um, water stress conditions. So as salinity increases your water stress conditions increase as well. So water does not move easily when you have too much salt in the system. High soil salinity can also cause nutrient imbalances that result in the accumulation of toxic elements. So it also can lead to where uh, toxic elements can work its way into the system as well if we have too much, um, too much salt in the soil. So just a couple sets of um, quiz slides here. Um, remember with these questions I don't need to see your answers if you want to go over the answers with me because you want to know if you're having trouble figuring it out based on the lecture. Um, yeah, go ahead and send me a message uh, through the Canvas inbox or uh, shoot me an email. Here's some more questions and let's keep going. So uh, in terms of reclaiming salty soils. So we got three three ways we can do that in terms of trying to get our our um, the soils back to where we want them. So we want to establish adequate drainage of the soil profile. So um, the slide earlier with the showing the tile drainage and the ditch drainage that's kind of the first uh, the first idea in terms of reclaiming salty soils, uh, and that has to do with that leaching requirement, figuring out how much of that extra water. Um, we're going to need, and so you can use a tile or ditch drain if uh, necessary. Um, we also want to lower our EC of our irrigation water, so we want um, 
for lack of a better term, we want cleaner water. We want water that's not going to cause us as much of a problem. Um, so uh, one thing that could help is to use flood type irrigation because it's going to reduce evaporation because it's going to sit on the uh, soil a little bit you know, longer. And then also there's chemical amendments to leach sodium. So you can use things like gypsum, sulfuric acid, and sulfur to actually pull um, that sodium out of the soil. We talked about um, leaching before and just the idea of, of pulling it um, through the soil. So in terms of gypsum, so the calcium in gypsum will exchange with sodium on clay particles. And calcium, unlike sodium, does not cause clay dispersion and soil aggregation does occur with calcium. So uh, cl uh, clay is a big fan of calcium. So gypsum, um, which is full, in, full of uh, calcium, is very good in terms of helping out with, uh, with the sodium on clay particles. Um, the free sodium ions then are easily leached in the irrigation water and work their way through the system. Perfect, good, fantastic. In terms of sulfuric acid, that combines with natural lime to, in soil, and then you end up producing gypsum. Perfect. We know already, we just talked about it, gypsum does a great job getting rid of sodium on clay particles, so gypsum does its thing. In terms of sulfur, that will slowly combine with water to produce sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid combines with natural lime, natural lime, sulfuric acid, you get gypsum, and we're right back to the start right there where we said it gets rid of the sodium. Fantastic. So uh, we had a leaching requirement earlier. Let's have a gypsum requirement. So the amount of gypsum required to reclaim salty soil. So there's our GR, our gypsum requirement, and then we have our ESP um, from before when we're, we were looking at our um, sodic uh, soil levels, our cation exchange capacity, and then our total weight of soil. So if we just throw in an example here and we say we had 20% ESP and our cation exchange capacity is 2%, if our soil is 4 million pounds per acre foot, you do 0.2 times 0.02, so 20% times 2% times the 4 million pounds, gives us 16,000 pounds or 8 tons of gypsum per acre that we would need to put down in terms of being able to reclaim our salty soil and get it back into play. So when you look at it and you say, really? Like 8 tons per acre? Yeah, it's a lot. And that's what it takes because even like we started off with the conversation, even a little bit of soils can be really, or a little bit of salt in soils can be really problematic. Managing our salty soil. So we got um, three minute, three methods of managing our salty soils. And re remember, the big thing with um, the big kind of overarching idea to remember with managing our salty salty soils is there's always going to be some amount of salt. So we're okay with some amount of salt, just not too much salt and not too little salt. Um, so our first method of um, managing salty soils is to reclaim the salty soils by uh, maintaining the higher than normal water content, which we've discussed that earlier. So um, really looking at ideas of irrigation, because um, we, don't, we don't want the soil to be too dry and we don't want it to be too wet, um, but we want to make sure uh, we pick the right method of irrigation, whether it's sprinkling or flooding or whatever method works. We're going to use water in terms of providing more, a higher water content to make sure that we can keep these salt um, levels in the soil where we need them to be. Um, another method we can look at is planting the crops on the slopes or shoulders of the beds because earlier talked about that idea with the with the saline seep here we can see the example of um, what happens in the rows where you get the salt accumulation because that's where the plant roots usually happen or usually occur is right there in the middle and so that's where we'd get the weathering uh, that's where we'd see weathering of our minerals in our soil that's where we'd see our 
our water issues because our water might be draining away in our rows. So we get salt accumulation right there at the top of the row. So maybe instead we plant at the edges, like in B where we double um, double bed the rows, or you uh, tilt the, uh, you slope the beds like in C, or you uh, have this alternate furrow irrigation to where uh, you just, you change it up and so you get the salt to accumulate in its spot, not where you're growing your plants. And so that way we can avoid having to deal, we know we might have these salt issues in our field, but if that's not where the plant's growing, then it's not a big deal. So trying to plant somewhere other than dead center in the middle of a row. And then the third idea, which for me is my favorite idea um, for all in terms of the three uh, ideas of how to manage your soils, because to me it's the, the least wasteful one in my mind is the idea of salt tolerant plants and just making sure to plant salt tolerant crops when possible. So things like small grains, like barley, sorghum, some cottons, Sudan grass, date palms, things that are okay uh, being in these salty soils. Some other examples, uh, things that are really tolerant. Uh, we mentioned barley, but sugar beets or triticale or um, in terms of forages, wheat grasses, wild rice, um, in terms of things that are moderate, moderately tolerant, so oats, safflower, sorghum, soybeans, wheat, um, trefoil, some tall fescue, some sweet clover, all those things are, are okay and have a good tolerance for uh, saline conditions or soils that are salty. So we mentioned this uh, earlier, the idea of how do we measure salt, and we kept talking about EC, so that's our electrical conductivity. And so our electrical conductivity methods, um, so you're usually going to see something like, it'll say um, DSM, and so those are uh, decisemians per meter. And uh, you can see the um, kind of the calculations down below, so decisemians per meter times 640 gives you parts per million and parts per million divided by 10,000 would give you a percentage. And so that's, so if we see an, um, an EC and a percentage, that's how we, we worked our way there. And there's four different ways you can measure electro, electrical conductivity. So vacuum extractors, um, in situ EC probes. So you can stick them in the ground, bulk soil ones where you, just get a, uh, a good amount of soil, and then there's also a metal ring probe. So just a few different ways that you can, that you can do it. Um, if we uh, had the chance to where we could go do a, a salt lab, we would have uh, done one of these methods. Here's uh, some examples of the idea of there's a, a probe or the sensor. So this is a direct soil probe down there in the bottom, uh, in the bottom uh, graphic. And you can see the probe that you just stick in. And then on the right there, you can kind of see the same idea where you just stick it in and then you look and make the, uh, the reading. Another way you can measure it is through electromagnetic induction. So uh, you send a strong you have a strong electro uh, magnet that's pulled over the soil and induces current in the soil relative to water and salt concentrations. So if you have more water and salt, you'll have a higher current, and so that's how it measures it. If you don't, if you have uh, less salt, less water, you're going to get uh, less current. If you have more current, you have more water and more salt. Uh, your second or receiving coil is also pulled over the soil near the induction coil and is induced by soil current. And so by knowing the soil water content, salt content measured as added induction relative to pure water. And so the idea of what does that look like? So we see our receiver coil and our transmitter coil, and this, um, this thing is dragged over the soil, and it's the electromagnets there, and we're looking for that current. And if we get a lot of current, then we have high salt concentrations and high water. Um, concentrations within our soil. And so just kind of um, like, so if we do this, what kind of data will we get? So if this is our area here, this is the kind of um, what, what we call a heat map that they, that they would put together. So 
your non-saline areas are the ones that are dark green, light green or slightly saline, orange or moderately saline, and then your red is your highly saline areas. So you can kind of um, see the the different looks here and just kind of see that idea of how this would work and how it can kind of show us, okay, these are our problem areas. These are where we see we have high saline problems or we have moderate saline problems and then we can we can deal with it. Um, this this field or this kind of specific field is um, what's getting known now as uh, precision agriculture where we can really figure out um, where specifically our problems are and being able to deal with them as opposed to just saying, well, you know, the, the crops are kind of bad right here. Well, why and where and how exactly and what parts of the soil and then this way we can really start dealing with the with the exact problem. And so here's a few more questions in terms of just trying to give you guys stuff to think about since we do have a test coming up after spring break. And so there's a few more questions and even a few more. And that's all I got for you. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Um, make sure if you uh, haven't looked at the other lectures, uh, take a look. They're up on my YouTube page as well as on Canvas, whatever works for you. And I will talk to you next time.